So welcome to module number 27, um, unit six. We're still in unit six, learning. Um, today we're gonna be talking about operant conditioning and a lot about BF Skinner. So there are several <laughs> learning targets. Again, lots of information that's important in this module. Um, at the end of this module, you should be able to describe operant condition, identify who BF Skinner is, and how operant behavior is reinforced and shaped. Really, really important for this class, for this, um, for the AP exam, and for life in general, is to be able to differentiate between positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement um, and punishment. Uh, explain, being able to explain how different reinforcement schedules affect behavior, really interesting, important stuff, again, for not only AP psychology, but for life. Be able to differentiate punishment from negative reinforcement. Note, they are not the same thing. And explain how punishment affects behavior. And be able to describe why Skinner's ideas provoked some controversy. So what is operant conditioning? It's, you, you, before we talked about classical conditioning, B.F. Skinner, he kind of um, saw what uh, John Watson had done, Pavlov, and thought, this is really interesting. And then he, thought, then he saw what uh, Thorndike's research and was like, wow, I'm really going to, I really think there's something to this. And he came up with his ideas and built upon what the behaviors before him had, had been discovering. So operate conditioning is a type of learning in which a behavior becomes more likely to recur if followed by a reinforcer or less likely to recur if followed by a punisher. And that is it in a nutshell. If you can understand that, you understand a lot within this module. So a quick comparison. As you know, last module we were talking about classical conditioning. Organisms form associations between two stimuli, right? A conditioned stimulus and, and the unconditioned um, stimulus. Classical conditioning also involves respondent behavior, automatic responses to a stimulus. Operant conditioning, on the other hand, happens when organisms asso associate their own actions with the consequences that occur right after it. Behavior that operates, that's where the operant comes from, on the environment to produce rewarding or punishing stimuli is called operant behavior. So here's a little tip if you're going to be taking the AP exam. You may have to differentiate classical conditioning and operant conditioning, so make sure those are clear in your mind. Classical conditioning is involuntary, while operant conditioning is voluntary. So who is B.F. Skinner? Well, he is a very famous psychologist who is from Pennsylvania, actually, just like I uh, am originally. <laughs> he his behaviorism was very influential and he became somewhat of a controversial figure for some of his ideas and books that he wrote later on in life. His work elaborated on what psychologist Edward Thorndike called the law of effect. So you can see he lived through most of the 20th century. And if you have time, watch some videos of him. He's a really interesting guy to listen to um, and hear some of his ideas about how Unlike John Watson, who, who did all the studies with classical conditioning and le ended up leaving Johns Hopkins University and going into advertising, B.F. Skinner really wanted to use behavioral principles to create a better world. So his intentions were really great. Now, um, some of the ideas that he had could, could be construed as a little bit dystopian when you listen to some of his conversations, but his intentions were to use behaviorism to make humanity better. So, Going back to Thorndike, what did Thorndike do? Thorndike used a fish reward to entice cats to find their way out of a puzzle box through a series of maneuvers. Sounds really simple, right? Now that we kind of know about rewards and how that can increase behavior, improve behavior um, in, in organisms, looking back at this, we're like, yeah, okay, that seems pretty simple. But at that point, we didn't understand that completely. So what is the law of effect? Thorndike's principle that behaviors followed by favorable consequences become more likely and that behaviors followed by unfavorable consequences become less likely. So the cat's performances, performance tended to improve with successive trials, illustrating Thorndike's law of effect. 
So what is Scanner Design building upon Thorndike's research? For his pioneering studies on operant conditioning, he designed what's called an operant chamber, or also known as a Skinner box. And you can see what it looks like there. So what is an operant chamber? In operant conditioning research, a chamber containing a bar or key that an animal can manipulate to obtain food or water, um, Attached devices record the animal's rate of pre bar pressing or key packing. So how does the Skinner box operate? Inside the box, the rat presses a bar for a food reward. Outside measuring devices, you can't see here, record the animal's accumulated responses. So what did the Skinner box allow those, the researchers to investigate? Well, it created a stage in which rats and other animals act out Skinner's concept of reinforcement which reinforcement is any event that strength, strengthens, which means increases the frequency of a preceding response. So this is really, 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 really important. What is reinforcing depends on the animals and the conditions. For people, reinforcing things may be praise, attention, or a paycheck. Now, different people are reinforced by different things. That's something we always have to keep in mind when we're thinking about these behavioral principles. For hungry and thirsty rats, food and water might work well. So are all reinforcers created equally? No. Again, what is reinforcing to one animal or human may not be re reinforcing to another. Um, when I worked as a school psychologist and we were dealing with kids that had some challenging behaviors that we were trying to, to change and, and turn into more positive behaviors, it was really important for us to figure out what was motivating for a particular child. Lots of times teachers would think that stickers or something like that, which are motivating to many children, would be motivating for every child, but they aren't, right? So you have to figure out what it is that is motivating for a particular organism. What makes a reinforcer a reinforcer? It's important to note that a reinforcer is defined by its effect on behavior. A reinforcer increases, increases the likelihood that the behavior will increase. Ice cream may sound at like it's a reinforcer for all, but what if the subject is lactose intolerant? You know, or food is a really good example. Lots of times things that some of us think are absolutely delicious, other people will not find them reinforcing at all. And so we have to keep in mind what is reinforcing for one is not reinforcing for all. So how is behavior shaped through operant conditioning? Shaping is an operant conditioning procedure in which reinforcement guides behavior toward a closer and closer approximation of the desired behavior. This is called successive approximations. And again, when I worked as a school psychologist, this was an important concept. Lots of times where a child was in terms of certain behavioral issue and where we wanted them to be was very, very far apart. So instead of us going that huge leap from one point to the other, we had to give, make really small, small goals to try to shape the behavior um, and this works quite well on, on certain, um, for certain outcomes. How would Skinner shape <clears throat> a rat's behavior to press a bar to get food? First, researchers would watch how the animal naturally behaves to build on existing behaviors. The rat would be given a bit of food, a reinforcement, each time it approaches the bar. Once the rat is approaching it regularly, food would only be given when it moves close to the bar, then closer still. Finally, experimenters would require the rat to actually touch the bar to get food. So this is, is shaping. What is a discriminative stimulus? Well, a stimulus that elicits a response after association with reinforcement. So Skinner may, try, may train a pigeon to peck at a green circle, but not a red square, right? And it's amazing what Skinner was able to do with these pigeons, things you wouldn't even, again, something you could check out on YouTube, lots of really cool videos of how amazing it was, the things that he was able to train the pigeons to do. So how have pigeons learned to discriminate? After being re reinforced with food when correctly spotting breast tumors, pigeons became as skilled as humans at discriminating cancerous from healthy tissue. And that was a study done in 2015. So there's a lot of amazing things you can do with these behavioral principles, especially in terms of animal training. So let's look at some more research on discriminative stim stimulus training. Dogs have been shaped to sniff out landmines um, or locate people amid rubble, really wonderful things that we, we've been able to train dogs to be able to do. 
After being trained to discriminate among classes of events or objects, pigeons can usually identify the category in which a new picture, pictured object belongs. How amazing is that? Think about that. We can train pigeons to differentiate between flowers, people, cars, chairs. Wow. Okay. Pigeons have even been trained to discriminate between the music of Bach and Stravinsky. Another wow. So what is positive reinforcement? We hear that term all the time and lots of times many people are confused about what it really means. Increasing behaviors by presenting positive reinforcers. A positive reinforcement is any stimulus that when presented after a response, strengthens the response, increases the likelihood of the frequency of the response. Negative reinforcement, don't get caught up on that negative term, it doesn't mean bad, um, is increasing behaviors by stopping or reducing an aversive stimulus, right? A negative reinforcement is any stimulus that, when removed after a response, strengthens, strengthens the response. So here's a little comprehension check. The purpose of reinforcement is to, this is key to understand for this class, is to cause a behavior to continue. See. What are examples of positive and negative reinforcement? So positive reinforcement, studying hard to receive an A. So your the behavior would be studying hard, the reinforcement would be the grade. Arriving at work on time to receive praise or a paycheck could be another example. Negative reinforcement, remember negative is not something bad, it's taking something aversive away. So taking an aspirin or some sort of medication to reduce a painful headache, right? So you, you're trying to remove something that is painful, literally, in this example, painful to you. Hitting the snooze button to shut off an annoying alarm clock. I do this way too many times in the morning, but this is another example of negative reinforcement. Note that negative reinforcement is not punishment. Negative reinforcement could be psychology's most under, misunderstood concept. It's removing a punishing aversive event. Think of negative reinforcement as something that provides relief um, from all these different examples on here. This is a term that is likely to be on the AP exam and one that is often confused. How about primary and secondary reinforcers? So primary reinforcers are innately reinforcing stimuli, such as those that we have a need to satisfy, like a biological drive to satisfy. So food, pain relief, those kind of things are primary reinforcers. Secondary or conditioned reinforcers are stimuli that gain their reinforcing power through their learned association with a primary reinforcer. So it could be money, it could be good grades, it could be a pleasant tone of voice. Uh, this last one's funny because my two sons yesterday were just commenting on how um, it is reinforcing for them when they hear my voice be happy rather than stressed out and <laughs> telling them to get a move on. So even something as simple as a pleasant tone of voice can be considered a, a reinforcer, but it would be considered a conditioned reinforcer. How does immediacy of the reinforcement impact behavior? Some animals need immediate, within 30 seconds, reinforcement in order to tie the reinforcement to the behavior. Humans, and especially older humans, respond to delayed reinforcement, even learn to delay gratification um, more so as a point of maturity. So it might be your paycheck at the end of the month, a trophy at the end of the season, the good grade that comes at the end of the entire year. Those are examples of delayed gratification. How about schedules of reinforcement? So reinforcement schedules are patterns that define how often a desired response will be reinforced. Two types of reinforcement schedules are continuous, which means it happens every single time you know, the desired response occurs, or partial, also known as intermittent, reinforcing only reinforcing a response only part of the time. So continuous reinforcement, again, learning occurs rapidly. Okay, sorry about that, another dog issue. Okay, so with continuous reinforcement, learning occurs rapidly. So it's the best choice for learning and behavior. The problem is, is that extinction occurs rapidly. So if you stop, the reinforcement, then the behavior immediately, pretty immediately, the um, the behavior that you were trying to increase could stop quite quickly. When continuous reinforcement stops, the behavior soon stops. It's extinguished. 
If a normally dependable candy machine fails to deliver a chocolate bar twice in a row, we'll stop putting money in it, likely. <laughs> um, although a week later, we may exhibit spontaneous recovery by trying again. So how about partial or intermittent reinforcement? What effect does that have on learning? Real life rarely provides continuous reinforcement. Salespeople do not make a sale with every pitch, but they persist because their efforts are occasionally rewarded. The, this persistence is typical with partial or intermittent reinforcement schedules in which responses are sometimes reinforced, not every single time. So sometimes they're reinforced and sometimes not. Learning is slower to appear when you use this type of schedule, but resistance to extinction is greater than with continuous reinforcement. So parenting lesson, <laughs> partial reinforcement also works with children. Occasionally giving in, and this isn't always what you want to happen, occasionally giving in to children's tantrums for the sake of peace and quiet intermittently reinforces the tantrums. This happens a lot. You know, think about the the kid in the line at the grocery store who really wants the candy, who um, is having a tantrum and has had tantrums doing this in the past, all of a sudden the parents just like, fine, you can have a Snickers. Well, that is an intermittent reinforcement schedule that is going to likely increase the likelihood of those tantrums happening in the future. This is the very best procedure for making a behavior worse and making it persist making that behavior worse, not necessarily any behavior worse, just that particular behavior I was talking about. So what are the four types of partial reinforcement? You can have ratio one, ratio schedules or interval schedules. Fixed ratio schedules happen when reinforcement occurs after a set number of responses. Fixed interval schedules are concerned with time. Reinforcement occurs after a set length of time. Variable ratio schedules, um, the reinforcement will occur after an unpredictable number of responses. In variable interval schedules, reinforcement occurs after an unpredictable length of time. So what are some examples of these different types of reinforcement schedules? With fixed ratio, you know, one free cup of coffee after every 10 purchase. This happens in most coffee shops now, right? So you're on a fixed ratio schedule. Wow, if I just get 10 cups, I can get, a, get one for free. Okay, that would be a fixed ratio schedule. A variable ratio schedule can be something is very addictive. Um, payoff on a slot machine after a varying number. You don't know how many times you're going to have to play the, until you get some sort of payout. A fixed interval schedule. Mail arrives at 2 p.m. every single day. I wish my our mail arrived every single day at the same time, but it never does. Um, a variable interval schedule, checking our phone for a text from a friend at different time periods. So an exam tip for the AP exam if you take it. Students sometimes have difficulty with the schedules of reinforcement. The word interval and in schedules of reinforcement means that an interval of time. When you see interval, you should be thinking time. So an interval of time must pass before reinforcement. There's nothing the learner can do to shorten the interval. The word ratio refers to the ratio of responses to reinforcements. If the learner responds with greater frequency, there will be more reinforcements. This is a likely, um, a concept that is likely to show up on the AP exam. So what about punishment? It's not negative reinforcement. That's what you should definitely understand. Punishment is different than negative reinforcement. And how is it different? Punishment is an event that tends to decrease the behavior it follows. Behavior that is punished is less likely to occur again. Punishment adds an aversive stimulus or removes a pleasant stimulus. Negative reinforcement, remember, increases the likelihood that the behavior will occur again. Negative re reinforcement re removes an aversive stimulus. Think about that taking an, um, medicine to remove a headache. Punishment tells you what not to do. Reinforcement tells you what to do. So what are two ways to punish unwanted behavior? You can either administer an adversive stimulus. This is called positive punishment. Again, don't think about positive and negative as bad and good. It's about administering or putting something in. Positive punishment is administering an adversive stimulus. For example, spraying water on a barking dog, getting a traffic ticket, giving a traffic ticket for speeding. Negative punishment is taking something away, taking something away that is rewarding. 
taking away a misbehaving teen's driving privileges or phone. I know that's one that's used often these days. Revoking a rude person's chat room access. Positive punishment adds something negative. Negative punishment takes away something positive. So what are four major drawbacks to the uses of punishment, physical punishment? Punished behavior is suppressed temporarily, not forgotten. The temporary state may negatively reinforce, re reinforce parents' punishing behavior because they, they're thinking it's working. But punishment teaches uh, discrimination among situation. It can teach fear. Physical punishment may actually increase aggression by modeling violence, which we're going to talk about when we get to Bandura, as a way to cope with problems. So why did Skinner's, what Skinner came up with, why did his legacy provoke controversy? Well, critics of Skinner's principles, his operant behavioral principles, his operant conditioning principles, believe the approach dehumanized people by neglecting their personal freedom. So Skinner was all about, you know, we don't really have free will. We're just sort of controlled by the actions around us. Skinner replied that people's actions are already controlled by external consequences and that reinforcement is more humane than punishment as a means for controlling behavior. You know, to Skinner, as I said at the beginning of this module, he thought that we could use these behavioral principles that he uncovered um, to make a better world and to, to really focus on reinforcement to sort of shape behavior to the way we, we should think it should be. So let's review these learning targets, and there were several in this module. What is operant conditioning? It's a type of learning in which behavior is strengthened if followed by a reinforcement or diminished, um, that means reduced, if followed by a punishment. Who is Skinner? Well, he was an English major. We didn't talk about that at the beginning, but um, <laughs> he was an English major and who later on went to graduate school in psychology and he became modern behaviorism's most influential figure. He was really influenced by Alon Edward Thorndike's studying of cats and his law of effect. Um, B.F. Skinner and others found that behavior of rats or pigeons placed in an operant chamber, which is also known as a Skinner box, can be shaped um, by, you know, into those successive approximations by using reinforcers to guide closer and closer approximations of the desired behavior. Reinforcement is any consequence that strengthens behavior. Positive reinforcement adds a desirable stimulus, increasing the likelihood the behavior will repeat. Negative reinforcement removes an aversive stimulus to increase the frequency of behavior. It is not the same thing as punishment. Primary reinforcers are things those biologically innately satisfying uh, reinforcers. No learning is required. Secondary or conditioned reinforcers are satisfying because we've learned to associate them with more basic rewards. Immediate reinforcers offer immediate payback. Delayed reinforcers require the ability to delay gratification. So more likely to happen in humans and as we mature as humans, more likely to happen more often. Think getting a paycheck at the end of the month. A reinforcement schedule defines how often a response will be reinforced. Continuous reinforcement schedules make learning happen rapidly, but extinction can happen more rapidly as well if the rewards cease. Partial or intermittent reinforcement with those, initial learning is a little bit slower, but behavior, behavior is more resistant to extinction. Fixed ratio schedules reinforce behaviors after a set number of responses. Variable ratio after an unpredictable number of responses. Fixed interval, we're thinking about time. So when we're talking about interval, so fixed interval reinforce behavior after set time periods, whereas variable interval after unpredictable time periods. Punishment is not negative reinforcement. <laughs> Punishment administers an undesirable consequence or withdraws something desirable in an attempt to decrease, decrease the frequency of a behavior. Negative reinforcement again, removes an aversive, aversive stimulus and increases the likelihood the behavior will be repeated. Punishment can have undesirable side effects, however. Sometimes punishment may be necessary, but we have to remember that it comes with some possible undesirable side effects, such as suppressing rather than changing unwanted behaviors, encouraging and creating fear, teaching aggression, um, and even such things as potentially fostering things like depression and low self-esteem. So we need to be careful with our use of punishment. And as Skinner would say, we should be focusing on the reinforcement. So why were Skinner's ideas controversial? 
Well, they thought it, it took away the idea that people had any free will. They, um, Skinner's critics believed that pro the approach dehumanized people by neglecting their personal freedom and seeking to control their actions. Skinner, the rebuttal was that people's actions are controlled by external consequences and that reinforcement is more humane than punishment as a means for controlling behavior. And there we are. We are at the end of module 27. Thank you for listening. Take care.